Welcome afternoon in Las Vegas. Here is sunrise over Tokyo, but are dark clouds on the horizon because of COVID. I'll speak with three-time Olympian, triple jump medalist Will Clay, just days before he's set to leave for Tokyo. Texas Democrats flee to D.C. Now at least five of them are COVID positive. Did the political stunt backfire? A Texas state Democrat joins us live. And remember Volusia County, Florida Sheriff Mike Chitwood? The, the, the system here in Florida and every other state when it comes to juvenile justice is broken. What Sheriff Chitwood found about drugs crossing into the U.S. in his latest trip to the Mexican border. The Donlin Report starts right now. Good evening, great to have you with us. The Olympics start Wednesday in Tokyo, a year late, of course, after a pandemic postponement, but tonight, a lot of people are wondering how these games will ultimately look. We now know three U.S. athletes have already tested positive. Tennis star Coco Goff, although she's still in the States, and an alternate on the high-profile USA gymnastics team, Kara Aker, who is now in isolation in Tokyo. By the way, her coach says she was vaccinated two months ago. Late today, we also found out Katie Lou Samuelson will not play for Team USA in basketball. She has also tested positive. No one else on the gymnastics team was affected, but another alternate is also isolating now because of contact tracing. Three more athletes at the Olympic Village have already tested positive. One from the Czech Republic, two men from South Africa's soccer team, and 21 of their close contacts now face new scrutiny before their first game, which is scheduled for Thursday of this week. The total number of infections since July 1st is at least 58. That's just the number of people connected to the game. So. Here we go. A lot of athletes are looking at daily testing, traveling in dedicated vehicles, training separately, even being confined to their rooms for meals. Not the Olympic Games they were hoping for. And don't forget, no fans will be allowed. No proud parents or emotional family members to show in the crowd once the competition begins. There was a story last week, by the way, that they're using cardboard beds to discourage any, well, let's just say, close encounters in the Olympic Village, although that story is now in question. So was this even a good idea? Should it have gone forward? There's a state of emergency in Tokyo. Will anyone be around for the closing ceremony in an empty stadium? That's where we start tonight with an Olympic athlete who's about to head to Tokyo, track and field star Will Clay. In the 2012 games, he won the bronze in the long jump and the silver in the triple jump. And then he won the silver again in the triple jump in 16. So let's start right there. Will, do you think this is going to work? Yeah, yeah, I do. I do feel like it's going to work. Um, I feel like these things that are happening right now are, are happening in order to make sure everyone else is safe. You know, so if there is a positive test and, and someone does uh, fail to meet the requirements, then, you know, I think that's to save, you know, the the other athletes and to save the actual games in order for them to happen smoothly. Yeah, I, I'm curious because 80% of the athletes are vaccinated and I know it feels like a personal question now, but I hope you don't mind if I ask you if you are and if not, are you worried? Either way, are you worried? Uh, no, I'm not worried. I feel like um, what the USOC has, has put together for us. I've been on my phone doing um, applications and doing COVID stuff this whole morning. So I'm not vaccinated, but uh, I do know that they're going to do, you know, what's right to keep us all safe. Um, as of right now, leading up to my flight, I'm just trying to stay away, stay away from, you know, anyone really just stay by my training partners and everyone that I've already been around who has already tested negative and, you know, just trying to stay out the way. Interesting that you're not. Do you mind if I ask why? Uh, man, it's just, uh, um, I, I think uh, I want to just, you know, learn more about it. I think I, I haven't been able to do enough of my own research um, on the vaccine to to really uh, know what um, the long-term effects of it will be. Hmm. So you leave Saturday. What has this been like for you, Will, to go through the delay, the pandemic, the uncertainty, all of it to get to this point? Um, this is what we dream for, man. This is, this is track and field. You know, this is this is the biggest meet of our of our careers right here. You know, this is the biggest competition that we can ever possibly have. And, you know, without that, our sport is pretty much dead. You know? So um, for me, I think I just uh, I want to go and handle business and, and come back safely and represent the U.S. In the, in, the, in the best way that I possibly can. What are they telling you, Will, about 
testing, about transportation, about housing. What are they telling you about all of this? What are you expecting as you head over there? As of right now, I know we, we get tested every day. I know that uh, we have to stay in the village. I know that uh, we, we're sleeping on cardboard beds. <laughs> I know um, that our coaches will have to stay at, a, at another hotel and we'll only be able to see them at practice. And um, we just go to and from the, the village and to the track, to the village, to the track. And uh, we can't go anywhere else. So, um, and, and we have to leave within 48 hours of the ending of our competition. So um, it's going to be pretty quick as far as the, the, the time that we're there. We're not going to be there for opening or closing ceremony. Oh, really? So, I hadn't heard that. You yeah, can't stay for the close? Well, yeah, no, we have to leave within 48 hours of uh, our competition. Who's we? Is that track and field or all of the U.S. athletes? Track, track and field, that's what we were told. Wow. So you were fortunate yeah. enough to uh, compete in 12 and then again in 16. How else do you think this experience will be different for you, Will? Oh, man, this is going to be completely different. This is a whole different uh, Olympic Games. And um, my hope is that it is something that people can watch on TV and get hope from to see all of us athletes come together and uh, to safely go and represent our countries. So I just, I, I know it's going to be a lot different, but um, I'm just trying to keep my, my hopes up and just make sure that I, I uh, go out there and handle my business. Yeah. So I know you're yeah. well aware of Rule 50, which bans demonstrations at the Olympics, raising a fist, yeah. taking a knee, wearing certain clothing. Do you think that's going to be an issue during these games? Um, I, I, I do. I think that people are going to be there and they're going to, uh, to uh, speak on what they believe in. You know, and I feel like when you don't have a platform um, before this and you get this big platform, you're going to, you know, push for what you believe is right. You know, so I think that um, just going back to like John Carlos and athletes like that, you know, that, that that's the inspiration for um, change, you know, for a lot of athletes trying to make change, you know, because we all see what's going on in the world and we have our views on it and um, and we we want to push what we believe is, is right and what we believe is, is uh, going to create equality in this world. So I, I think that, you know, it, it's, it shouldn't be a rule. It shouldn't be a rule 50. It should, it should just allow people to just, you know, speak on what they believe is, is right and um, let it be that. Do you have anything but, um, planned if you end up on the medal stand again, hopefully? Nah, my, my, uh, my competition will speak for itself. All right, well, let's talk about something you're doing off the track, Will, and that is uh, music and also clothing. So tell us quickly about that before we let you go. Yeah, so I'm, I'm finishing up an album right now, um, working with Red Bull Records, and I, uh, I, was, I was planning on um, putting it out before the Olympics, but uh, at this point I want to focus on what I'm doing. And um, also I have my clothing line, Elevate, um, which is uh, the – really the fuel to my foundation. We have a foundation called Elevate Youth Empowerment. And um, the clothing line is, is used to, uh, to help children around the U.S. and give them exposure to just different, uh, different routes to take, you know, as far as when they're going through um, college and just giving them exposure to things like taxes and, and uh, credit and things like that that we just didn't get. We didn't get that knowledge growing up. So we want to be able to give the next generation a head start. You're going to mask up? Of course, every day. <laughs> All right. I'm glad to hear it. Every Stay day. safe. Will, it's great to see you. Best of luck to you. We'll be watching you and pulling for you. And uh, we can't wait to see you in Tokyo. Take care, my friend. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. With the spread of the Delta variant and the vaccination rate slowing down, America asking the question now, will mask mandates make a comeback? They already have in L.A. County. And here to talk about that is Leland Vitter, host of On Balance, which debuts here on News Nation tonight, as a matter of fact. So it's tonight? It, you better be ready, my friend. <laughs> Time's up. So masks, masks are back. Uh, what are yeah. we to make of this in L.A.? Well, it's interesting because masks are back as the Delta variant infections are going up in L.A., but the sheriff there in Los Angeles says this isn't based on science. So he says he's not going to enforce the mask mandate and has told his deputies, gee, we're not going to allow you to issue any fines. The underfunded, defunded Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department will not expend our limited resources and instead ask for voluntary compliance. That's the L.A. County Sheriff. And what we're seeing here is an interesting thing that's happening in America because uh, go back 
12 or 16 months at the beginning of the pandemic. There was this concept of we are all in this together. There was this concept of shared sacrifice. People were comparing it to World War II as we all sacrificed to fight the Nazis. And now there is a different concept here. And people are saying, look, if I'm vaccinated and vaccines work as we are being told they do, why should I have to wear a mask to protect those that are voluntarily not getting the vaccine? That's becoming a new question. It's a question a lot of people are talking about now individually amongst themselves and amongst their friends. Pretty soon the courts are going to be talking about it. Well, a lot, they already are in yeah. some cases. We're going to be talking about that in just a minute here. But I think a lot of people, too, feel like I've, those who have been vaccinated, I did my part. Right. right? This, was, exactly. this was what we were all supposed to do. The people this is on now are the people who are getting sick and dying, and those are the unvaccinated. Right. In, in Los Angeles, the place that they're putting the masks back on, uh, somewhere between 99.5 and 100 percent of the people who are in the hospital are unvaccinated, meaning that the vaccine is 100 percent effective in keeping you from dying. May not be effective in keeping you from getting right. mildly ill, may not be right. in being able to be contagious, but it brings up sort of this analogy. We were kicking this around a little bit earlier. Think about it this way. If the vaccine's available to everybody, it's like seatbelts, right? Wear seatbelts in your car. It's going to keep you safe. The vaccine will keep you safe. If people choose not to wear their seatbelts, the government doesn't say all of a sudden, hey, everybody has to drive at 20 miles an hour because there may be people out there wearing seatbelts and we want to make sure that if they're in a car crash, it's at slow speeds. We say, here's seatbelts, wear them if you want. And if you decide not to, that's on you. Right. And it could be, you could be cited for such, which is where it gets dicey with the vaccine, well, right? Yeah, exactly. And I know you've got, a, you've got something coming up. Is, are you cited for not having the vaccine or are you not allowed to do certain things right. because you don't have the vaccine? And whether you're a government saying that or a private industry saying that or a private business, different things. Right. On Balance premieres tonight right after our broadcast, 8 Eastern, 7 Central. What do you have tonight? Well, we're going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, we're going to also talk about Cuba and a huge thing down, down there about how this is dividing the Democratic Party. We have a great uh, interview coming up with a Democratic state rep. President Trump won her district, and she now says this is Joe Biden's moment to tear down the wall moment. He mm. needs to stand up to the Cubans the way Ronald Reagan stood up to Gorbachev. That's right. a Democrat saying it. Well, we'll talk to Republican Adam Kinzinger about Cuba as well coming up. Great in interview there. So look for uh, Leland's show coming up tonight in just about 48 minutes. Leland, thanks. All right. Forcing the vaccinated and those who already contracted COVID-19 to wear masks indoors. That's part of what we're going to talk about next. The underfunded and uh, situation in California. We're going to talk with the, or uh, so I'm sorry, in Texas, I should say, the lawmakers who split town and went to D.C. One who has fully or thankfully tested negative is State Representative Alex Dominguez. He joins us next to talk about what's up for the delegation. And we mentioned Representative Adam Kinzinger. He has not skipped town. He talks to us live from Washington. What does he make of Senator Lindsey Graham suggesting Republicans skip town to avoid a vote of their own? That's ahead. And don't forget to follow us on social media at The Donlin Report on Twitter. Well, maybe that's not such a bad idea. South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham saying Republicans in the U.S. Senate might consider following the lead of fleeing Texas state Democrats to stop the White House infrastructure proposal. If for some reason they pass reconciliation uh, budget resolution to bring that bill to the floor of the United States Senate, the $3.5 trillion bill, you got to have a quorum to pass a bill in the Senate. I would leave before I'd let that happen. So to my Republican colleagues, we may learn something from our Democratic friends in Texas. So is it what goes around comes around or is this a dangerous precedent? Let's ask Representative Adam Kinzinger of Illinois. Congressman, let's start with that headline. We'll get to Cuba in a minute. What do you think of this? Senator Graham says maybe the senator should skip town on the reconciliation vote. Would you be on board with that? No, I hope he's being tongue in cheek. I want to get out of this like skip in town to stop things from happening trend we're on because look, you know, we're hired to come do a job. Uh, reconciliation's a legitimate process. We used reconciliation. And so while I don't 
you know, want a $3.5 trillion bill. We're hired to do a job. Let's come do our jobs and, uh, you know, and stop the skip in town game. Because if you think about it, if, if all of a sudden, if you know you're going to lose a vote, the minority party just starts skipping town <laughs> in every state or D.C., I don't know how you're ever going to get democracy to function again. Yeah, well, that is the question. And we'll ask one of those uh, fleeing Democrats in the next segment. I, I wanted to have you on, Congressman, because of your military background. You served in Iraq and Afghanistan. And we sort of last week gamed out what should happen or what could happen in Cuba. Um, you know, you hear the time is now. But we talked with two military experts who said there is no way the U.S. is going in there. Do you see any, any uh, possibility of that? Not really. Not militarily. Because, you know, first off, there's the Russia factor, which has been at play really since Russia, before they were even the Soviet Union. Uh, I think a military option, you know, short of something like maybe, I don't know, an attack on Gitmo, which is our large naval base there in Cuba, is probably not in the cards, but there's a number of things that can be done that can have an impact. First off, if we can restore internet to the island, as I know has been floated, that would be huge to get those messages out, to, to be able to communicate back into Cuba. And then secondarily, we need to be making strong statements, not just the United States, but with every freedom-loving country around the world saying we stand with the free Cuban people, you know, targeted sanctions against individuals doing business in Cuba, benefiting the dictatorship there. There's a number of things that can be done, but they are, people are starving to death in Cuba. People have no basic things that we have. And so anybody that would defend the regime there, I'd challenge them to go. So there's a lot we can do, but I don't think military in the case of Cuba would be in the cards. Well, that's certainly what they're calling for in Miami, the, the protesters who are blocking highways and streets. I mean, they're volunteering to go down there themselves, and, and they're not exaggerating. Uh, so what else do you think might, we're talking about trying to overthrow essentially a communist government and insert a democracy. Do you see that happening with the things you're suggesting here? I think it would be the people doing that. Now, where I could see a role, whether it's U.S. intel or agencies or potentially the military, is if this turns into just basically a slaughter. In that case, it would be a humanitarian reason to go in and stop the slaughter. But the United States, I mean, there, there's this perception, it's really a misperception in Central and South America that the U.S. likes to just come in and install, you know, different regimes. The U.S. wouldn't come in and do that. This is the Cuban people saying it's time for this to be over. And look at the parallels to the Soviet Union. Eventually, the Soviet Union fell not by the U.S. military invading Eastern Europe, but by the third generation of people that live behind the Iron Curtain saying, enough. We know what's on the other side of this curtain, and we want it. And I think that's what can and should happen in Cuba. And us having moral support with our allies and being very clear and clear-eyed has more of a benefit than I think any of us can understand. Do you think that might also require the Cuban military turning as well in order for that to happen? Yeah, certainly. Um, you know, the Cuban military is very weak. What they have really good, though, is intelligence services. Keep in mind, Maduro in Venezuela was, is only being basically propped up by Cuban intel assets. It's this kind of unholy alliance that exists. And so ultimately, it's possible that the military could turn and basically say, we're going to take over and create a democracy. Uh, but again, there, there have been decades of just oppression, decades of starvation. And to see the Cuban people for the first time in many of these people's lives actually go out and say, we're done enough. That should be heartening to us as Americans, uh, as well as, you know, stoking our compassion. But uh, we certainly need to stand with them morally and in every way we can. Let's talk quickly about some politics. We've seen Eric Adams win the Democratic primary for New York City mayor and bring the party more to the center. I wanted to ask you if you think there is that candidate in the Republican Party, and if so, who is it? Well, I mean, look, I, as of today, I haven't seen any. Um, you know, I think somebody like a Tim Scott could be fantastic. Uh, I think ultimately we have to come to grips with what happened on January 6th, take full accountability for that, recognize that can never happen again, and look and say, what are we talking about as a party? Are we more interested in engaging on a cultural outrage of the day? Or do we want to actually talk about the fact that in the south side of Chicago, there are kids born into an environment where you're more likely to be shot than you are in some war zones? And how can we give prosperity and opportunity to those kids? Some of the same challenges, by the way, in the rural community. If somebody can come along and articulate that, I believe the Republican Party will be the majority party for a generation. Short of that, if we're going to continue to engage in just culture wars because it's great for fundraising, it's going to be tough. Do you think Donald Trump runs in 24? 
You know, I, I, I'm going to say no, but I will tell you that every prediction I've ever made about Donald Trump has been incorrect. But here's what I think he does. I think he, you know, it's an ego thing, so he's going to keep doing this. Everybody's going to try to get him to, to, you know, bless them, and he'll ultimately end up blessing somebody. But I think that control and power is what he's seeking right now, just over those candidates that are desperately trying for his affection. All right, on the way out, I did want to congratulate you. I saw on your Instagram page yesterday that you and your wife are, are expecting to add a passenger to the manifest uh, in January. You ready? Right. you ready for that? I think so. I'm 43 years old, so, you know, you get to the point where you're like, yeah, it's time for something different, and I think having a new baby boy would certainly be a, something a little different. We're excited. All right, sounds good. Congressman Adam Kinzinger, thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Anytime. See ya. Billionaire Jeff Bezos prepares to blast off into space tomorrow morning. Can you believe someone passed on joining Blue Origin's inaugural journey? Who's filling that seat? We'll head live to Texas with an update ahead of the launch. And Texas Democrats, state lawmakers, caught a plane to Washington to avoid a vote, but five have now also caught COVID. One of the lawmakers who has remained negative, thankfully, State Representative Alex Dominguez, joins us next. Well, just a few minutes ago, we talked with Representative Adam Kinzinger about the Texas state representatives who skipped town to avoid a vote. One of them, Alex Dominguez, joins us now. He was among members flying to Washington last week to prevent that vote on election reform, but five of them have now been diagnosed with COVID, not, thankfully, Representative Dominguez, though. He joins us now. Um, any regrets now, Representative, because this is, is starting to backfire, it seems. I, I don't know why you would think that it's backfiring. You know, people catching COVID once again is merely an indication that this virus is very pervasive. In fact, the current Delta variant is extremely contagious. This right. is something that could have happened back home. And who knows, as far as we know, the members caught it at the state capitol. Well, I guess my point is that you're making news now for the wrong reasons. Well, you know, I, I think if nothing else, that certainly brings uh, to focus the attention that the country needs, not just on our own plight, but also that of the number of, of Americans that are catching coronavirus still. We are not clear of this pandemic, and we must all be vigilant. So are you, do you regret not wearing masks on the plane? Looking at the picture, again, your, your critics are having a field day with this. They say this is sort of uh, instant karma, if you will, and it's more proof that you shouldn't have left to begin with. I think the irony here is that our critics are the folks that were championing not wearing masks at all, even all of last year. In fact, once the governor lifted his mask mandate, that seems to be when the trouble started up again. I think what's important here is that we followed all CDC guidelines. Every person on the plane was vaccinated. In our close um, quarters talks, we've had numbers of members all vaccinated, none of us testing positive. So it's a very, very small number. And I think this goes to show that the science behind the vaccines is pretty solid. Well, we, we were never have guaranteed to wear them. that there was a 100% vaccination. Uh, we still have to wear them on planes, though. I guess that's why I was surprised that you weren't on yours. Um, but is this creating a situation? You know, I, and well, that, now that you bring it up, it, it's, it, it's kind of odd that we actually weren't even reminded of this by the flight crew. Uh, okay. Uh, what, what I'm wondering about here and what we just talked with Representative Kinzinger about is sort of the precedent that this sets. And as, as we heard now, uh, there's talk from Senator Graham about the U.S. Senate potentially leaving to avoid a vote on reconciliation. Do you realize this is the slippery slope and what you're going to be hearing about this, correct? Well, I'll tell you what, if we are in any way influencing Senator Graham, I have a few other suggestions that might help out this entire country. But more to the point of his, uh, I think, tongue-in-cheek example, the difference here is the Senate, in this case, the Republican senators, have no one to appeal to. In our case, the reason why we're here is because we're trying to implore our lawmakers up here in D.C. to pass some federal legislation, such as the John Lewis Voting Rights Act right. or the For Your People Act, For the People Act. But that if doesn't these get seem passed, to be happening what either, Abbott though, is trying it? to accomplish in Texas becomes null and void. Right. That, that's not going anywhere either at this point, though, right, Representative? So how much longer will you stay there? What's the plan? I pack to be here until August 7th. August 7th. Okay. And so if there's another special session announced after that, will you continue to stay in D.C.? 
No, I haven't crossed that bridge yet, but more importantly, what we're trying to do now is certainly focus not just on the voting rights of people in Texas, but we've begun a national conversation of voting rights that are being trying to strip away in multiple states. Uh, we see similar bills or different types of bills, such as in Pennsylvania, Arizona. We've already seen two types of bills like this passed in Georgia and Florida. This seems to be the Republican playbook to try to disenfranchise voters throughout the entire country. People trying to uh, exercise their freedom to vote is being frustrated by these governors who still are trying to fight and prove Trump's big lie that he somehow had his election stolen from him. Well, I guess there are some constituents who would argue, though, that you're disenfranchising your voters, Representative, by not being there to do the state's business. Whether or not you like the end result, the, the result is that elections have consequences. You know, on the contrary, so I was elected by my constituents in my district to not only defend the U.S. Constitution, but also the Texas state constitution. And among those rights are our rights to vote, to express ourselves at the right. ballot box. In my the legislature, are which you're not in. extremely supportive of our efforts. Yeah. I think that you're listening to the wrong media in no, Texas. No, I'm just in asking. Texas, I'm just people asking. People are very glad that we're fighting I'm for I'm sure them. there are, I guess, but there are others who want to know why you feel like this is the way to go when uh, every other legislature comes to work with a lunch box and, and takes the votes. Well, I'll tell you what, the, the type of uh, premise that you're making is that uh, our Democratic members did not achieve a majority, and thus we must sit there and take it no matter what the bill is that the Republicans are trying to pass. That is not a Texas way. We don't just sit there and take it. My constituents did not elect furniture. They elected a champion. They elected a fighter, and I will fight for them. All right, Representative Alex Dominguez, it's always good to have you on. I appreciate you coming on and talking to us. Thank you. Amazon founder Jeff Bezos preparing for takeoff tomorrow. How will his journey to space differ from Richard Branson's as the billionaire space race enters round two? A Florida sheriff reaches a little far from his purview. Why he traveled more than 1,000 miles from his county to the southern border in McAllen, Texas. That's ahead. Some breaking news, House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy has tapped five Republicans for the House's January 6th commission. Let's get the latest on that now from News Nation's Joe Khalil. Joe? Yeah, we were just able to confirm, Joe. Uh, Jim Jordan, Jim Banks, Rodney Davis, Kelly Armstrong, Troy Nels. Those are going to be the five Republicans uh, that will represent, be represented on this committee uh, from the Republican choices. An interesting list here. You know, there were some questions, some concerns about whether or not you'd have people who were on this committee doing serious work trying to get to the truth or whether there were going to be, uh, frankly, some firebrands uh, on this who, who may be steering the committee in a more partisan way. The name that sticks out out, uh, obviously, is Jim Jordan. We, he, he is very well known for uh, sort of being combative in committees, and he's very clearly uh, in that sort of MAGA camp, a very strong Trump supporter. Uh, so that's one name that sticks out. Uh, we actually just talked to Congressman Kinzinger a while ago about this list. The name that he said he's happy to see on this list uh, is Rodney Davis, a congressman from Illinois, who we've had interactions with, frankly, in terms of just temperament, maybe one of the more moderate and, frankly, nice uh, members of Congress uh, that you have there. Um, so it's an interesting list. Uh, Leader McCarthy clearly tried to, I think, mix it up. You know, again, there were questions about what kind of uh, committee this was going to be on the Republican side, and it's, it's a different mix of personalities. We'll see how they mesh with the Democrats on this. Joe, one uh, point here, out of these five members, three of them actually voted on January 6th to object to the election results. That is going to be a point that will not be lost on Democrats, and I'm sure something you'll hear more about next week as this committee actually starts its work. All right, Joe Khalil, live for us tonight in Washington. Thank you very much. We're failing miserably as Americans. We're failing miserably. There's no accountability. The, the, the system here in Florida and every other state when it comes to juvenile justice is broken. That was Sheriff Mike Chitwood of Volusia County, Florida. We've had him on before to talk crime in Florida, his area of expertise. Now he just got back from a trip to the southern border in McAllen, Texas, where he got a closer look at the influx of drugs coming across the border that affect his community more than 1,000 miles away. And joining me now is Volusia County, Florida Sheriff Mike Chitwood. Again, it's good to see you again, Sheriff. Now that's, that's the obvious question in the first one here. What's a Florida Sheriff doing at the Mexico border in Texas? Yeah, Governor DeSantis made a commitment to the governor, Governor Abbott, that he would send resources to help out 
and, he, and the governor has sent Highway Patrol, Florida Highway Patrol members down there. It's a matter of time before we start sending deputies down to the border. I wanted to go down along with my fellow sheriffs at the invitation of Congresswoman Kat Kamek and see firsthand what's going on down there, what kind of resources am I going to provide, and what are my men and women looking at when they get there? You actually got a lot of pushback about this trip, Sheriff. I know I, I saw on your Twitter feed where people were saying this was a, a, a waste of local resources. Yeah, well, you know, they're not one of the over a thousand families who have lost a loved one to this terrible, terrible fentanyl crisis and quadruple the number who have overdosed. And we know for a fact, being part of federal and state task forces, that the overwhelming majority of fentanyl, heroin, and methamphetamine that's coming into Florida is coming in through the Mexican border. And going down there and seeing this firsthand, especially in McAllen, Texas, where 43% of all the drugs that are entering this country are entering through that point, it, it's beyond crisis. It's, it's, it's about ineptitude down there is what I saw. Yeah, I was going to ask you what exactly you saw. and Was there something that surprised you that was even worse than you expected going in? What surprised me was how defeated the brave men and women of the Border Patrol are. Uh, there's a coordinated attack on the on the border. What they do is th these coyotes and, and the cartels, they send streams of women and children into different locations in the border and at the border wall. And then when they tie up all the resources, that's when the drugs and the, and the gang members and, and the convicted felons come in and get around and make a mad dash for it to get into America. They're called getaways, and they're, they estimate over 200,000. And there's a reason why they don't want to go through the process, because they're there to control the drug t trade in this country and the human trafficking that's going on with these young kids. Well, it's, uh, I'm sure, quite an eye-opener for you, and I'm sure it'll help impact how you decide to send those resources to the border when, indeed, you do. Volusia County, Florida, Sheriff Mike Chitwood, again, it's great to see you again. Thank you. Thank you, sir. A federal judge rules in favor of a public university mandating the COVID vaccine for students. We'll talk to the lead attorney for the plaintiffs, who says he plans on going all the way to the Supreme Court. Also, the Biden administration blaming China for a massive hack on Microsoft email systems. Whose email did they read and what are they doing with it? You've got mail. China has it too. The U.S. is alleging anyway. The Biden administration, along with Western allies, saying China hacked Microsoft's email systems to steal vast amounts of private information. Many of the world's largest companies, as well as crucial government contractors, use Microsoft Exchange servers for email. The U.S. claiming further China paid criminal groups to conduct the hacks and to plant ransomware, which is used to bribe companies to get their information back. Former State Department advisor Christian Whiten joins us often, and he does again tonight. Christian, we focus a lot on Russia with these hacks. What does the accusation against China mean? Well, it's interesting because, as you point out, we always hear so much about Russia, but this was actually a potentially more pernicious attack, much more sophisticated than the ransomware attacks that we've seen recently against things like the Colonial Pipeline. That's fairly old-fashioned as far as cyber attacks go, where you simply encrypt someone's information and, and require a bribe to decrypt it. Uh, the Microsoft Exchange server, a zero-day attack, was, was much more sophisticated, and now um, the White House has confirmed what a lot of people in the cyber business suspect which is that China, and specifically China's Ministry for State Security, that's their sort of uh, KGB, if you will, was behind this. And also, it wasn't just the Biden administration that said this, but also NATO and the EU, and also our Five Eyes intelligence sharing partners all jumped in, which is somewhat of a watershed. So what do we do about it? Well, you know, there's a question of whether or not you can retaliate. Now, we can't uh, easily retaliate against countries that do this as, as easily as they can attack us. After all, if they shut down communications in a hospital, actually, under the rules of, of, of war, the law of war, which we have to abide by, we can't really attack a foreign hospital. There is a question of whether or not you can shut down foreign government systems. So there's at least some deterrent effect. You know, President Biden has twice threatened to do that on Russia and mm -hmm. hasn't followed through on either instance. So it might be something worth trying. Right. The other thing that caught my eye here was that we've talked, you and I, before about how Russia has had these third, sort of third parties that they can say, well, it's not us. This is, you know, someone else. This similar thing seems to be happening with 
with China where they paid criminal groups to conduct these hackings. And yet in the end, we've found that it is China doing it. Right. And it's somewhat like a what would uh, be known in the 18th century as a letter of mark, a license from the state to go and do something that would otherwise be illegal. Um, somewhat entrepreneurial. They find people who are already successful at hacking and cyber attacks and they go and say, OK, uh, keep doing what you're doing. You work for us now. Um, and then they can pretend when they talk to our officials that, well, it's rogue groups within our country or maybe it's some other country. Um, but this makes it pretty clear that it was a Chinese instrumentality that did this. Right. A lot of saber rattling over Taiwan, Christian, and uh, we're going to have to get to that to the next time we talk because I know we will soon, but we appreciate your time tonight. Thanks, Joe. A federal judge has ruled in favor of Indiana University's COVID-19 vaccination requirement for students, marking one of the first rulings to uphold such a mandate. A lead attorney for the plaintiffs argues this is an example of the government forcing you to do something that you strenuously object to and have your body invaded in the process. Joining me now is the lead attorney for the plaintiffs, Jim Bob Jr. So Jim, here's what I don't get. Your workplace can force you to get a vaccine. Why is the school different? Because of the government. And the government has to comply with the Bill of Rights and the United States Constitution. And uh, where an employer has a lot of rights vis-a-vis uh, -vis their employees. So Indiana University, as the government, must uh, obey the due process clause of the 14th Amendment, and they can only violate your rights uh, if there is a sufficient justification for doing so. And we are arguing that there is not. So you're saying that if this were a private university, which hundreds of private universities have instituted these vaccine requirements, that's a separate thing. But because this is a public institution, it shouldn't have been included? That's correct, uh, that because the Constitution applies uh, if they violate rights. And of course, we're arguing that the right to bodily uh, integrity and the right to bodily autonomy that the Supreme Court has long recognized in many contexts protects uh, students who are adults from being required to, ex to uh, accept medical treatment that they have refused to do. And, uh, and we think that is fundamental and that the uh, university must demonstrate a compelling governmental interest in order to do this. And the problem that we have here with the judge's ruling is he, he didn't recognize that there were any rights involved. Right. I mean, uh, the, the, the one point he, that you did make also is another one that people have made about the vaccine only having emergency approval. And that was, uh, I guess, dismissed as well, along with your point that... Um, uh, the judge rejected and said that the university did make exceptions for the students who didn't want to get it. Yeah, but the, the fundamental problem, which we are going to appeal uh, to the Court of Appeals, is a, the, the court refused to recognize that there was a fundamental right involved. Uh, these are adults. These are not children. And so these adults get to make the same medical treatment decisions that you or I get to make. And they can only be overridden if there's a really compelling reason. And with and there's two reasons why there's not. Number one, uh, we are at the end phase of the pandemic. It's, you know, started, went up, came down, and we are now at the lowest level we have been since March of 2000, 2020. 95% decrease in the number of cases and the death rate. So we are at the end. Now, I, could, I, I would agree there were compelling interests at the beginning. There were compelling interests as we went up. And well, there are compelling interests now, you could argue, Jim, because the people who are getting sick are, and dying are the people who are not vaccinated. Yeah, but it's not, it's not that there are individual instances of people getting the uh, infection or dying. I, look, there's, how many diseases are there that there are people out there dying from? From the flu, from tick bites, from uh, all sorts of things, all right? And we don't... Uh, not 600,000 in a year, though. Well, but, but you, you don't add up what happened historically. You look at the situation right now. Currently, the death rate in, in the state of Indiana is three deaths per day. Now, look, there are more people dying from lightning strikes in the state of Indiana than there are from COVID. So the question uh -huh. always has to be, in the, in the situation we're in, 
Is there a compelling reason to strip people of their rights uh, to decide medical treatment? Well, we'll and see. That's, what, Go ahead. that's what's at stake here. All right, we'll see what happens on appeal because I know you said that's where you're headed. Jim Bob Jr., lead attorney for the plaintiffs and America's Frontline Doctors Litigation Director as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Three, two, one, and blast off. That's what Amazon founder Jeff Bezos and Blue Origin are hoping to say tomorrow morning. How will Bezos' voyage to space be different than Richard Branson's? We're live on the ground from Texas with an update ahead of tomorrow's launch. Marky joins us ahead. Don't forget, you can follow us on social media at The Donlin Report on Twitter. We are back and we're all systems go for Amazon founder Jeff Bezos to take flight tomorrow morning, 8 a.m. Central Time from Van Horn, Texas. Bezos follows in Richard Branson's footsteps for what is the second leg of the billionaire space race. For more ahead of tomorrow's launch, let's head to El Paso, Texas right now, where News Nation's Marky Martin is standing by. So, Marky Bezos, I know, talked about this controversy over the billionaires going to space. What do you have to say? Yeah, he had a lot to say, Joe. We have a green light for tomorrow. And let me tell you one thing first, too. If all goes according to plan, this will be a dream realized for Jeff Bezos. The Amazon founder saying that he has dreamt of this moment since he was five years old. And now that we are just T-minus, what, 13 hours until this launch, we're now getting a behind-the-scenes look at this crew in action, this crew in training. So I want to show you this video. And also keep in mind, too, this is the first human flight for the new Shepard rocket. Take a look. All right. Feels good to be in the flight suit. Oh boy, you guys look great. Welcome astronauts to Launch Site One and welcome to the Astronaut Training Center. This capsule is the RTS Tortoise. It is a full scale mock-up. How you guys feeling? I have so good. good. I literally have had goosebumps since I started. <laughs> like they haven't gone away. You got to love the brutal honesty from his brother there. So, Joe, there have been 15 automated test flights up to this point, but this will be the first one with humans on board. So you can only imagine how they feel. And there's a lot on the line here, Joe. So little, tell us a little more, Marky, about the crew. I know there was one person who, who said they had a scheduling conflict, but they filled the spot. Yeah, so Joe, there are four crew members here. That final seat went to an auction winner who paid $28 million, but then said, you know what? I've got to choose another flight in the future. I'm having some scheduling conflicts. So it went to the runner up and it went to that runner up son. So from the beginning, you have Jeff Bezos, of course. You have his younger brother, Mark, who's a firefighter. Then you have veteran female pilot Wally Funk and this 18 year old Dutch teenager. So we'll be there tomorrow for the whole thing. Joe, back yes, to you. oldest and youngest. Can't wait, Marky. Thank you. Live from El Paso ahead of tomorrow's big launch. Well, we spoke a little bit earlier about a bit of COVID 19 controversy at the Tokyo Olympics this year. In particular, there was some question about the cardboard beds at the Olympic Village, some speculating they were intended to discourage um, close contact, shall we say. But an Olympic gymnast from Ireland says that's fake news. In today's episode of Fake News at the Olympic Games, the beds are meant to be anti-sex. They're made out of cardboard, yes, but apparently they're meant to break at any sudden movements. It's fake. Fake news. Fake news. Apparently, it's for the easier disposal after the Olympics.